being with us uh, today. Um, my name is uh, Jesse. I'm lead pastor here at Ovation Church. Let me just real quickly before I get into everything, mention if it is your first time or maybe your second or third time, if you've never filled out a connection card, we want to connect with you and thank you for being here. So fill this out. Give us some of your basic info on here and you can drop this connection card in one of the giving boxes attached to the walls right as you exit the sanctuary today. And man, we are so glad that you're worshiping with us today. So we are kicking off a brand new series today about God never said that. Now, now the reason why we're doing this series is because I, like you, hear a lot of people say things that they claim came from God. And and, and actually, you know what, what, what is really strange about the culture that you and I live in is so much of our culture has been influenced by Scripture and so much of our culture has been influenced by Christianity that it's really just part of the conversation oftentimes between friends, well-meaning believers, politicians, religious leaders, that, that oftentimes actually... What most people believe, think about this, and this is probably true for you if you really think about it, what most people believe about God, what most people believe about the scriptures and Christianity is based on what somebody told them God said rather than them actually learning it for themselves what God said. Think about that. And so you've got people that have completely bought into and have based their life on a belief system that for sadly a lot of people is only based on what other people have told them God said. And so because of that, um, well-meaning people, I don't don't think it's malicious and, and evil and conniving, but oftentimes in our culture we see people say something And assume that it's biblical, assume that it's something that God agrees with. But we have to ask ourselves, did God really say that? And so what we're doing over these next couple of weeks is we're looking at five specific statements and, and, and ideas that our culture has attached to themselves to that think and believe that it came from God. But what we're going to see is that scripture actually says something a little differently. And so we're going to get into this and look at it. And before I get into today's, let me just tell you, just warning, heads up, next week, is honestly, next week's topic is probably the main reason why I was like, we've got to do this series to combat this one thing that I hear so many people talk about. And so next week, we're looking at a scripture, probably one of the uh, most well-known scriptures from people that are not Christians and not believers and don't go to church, one of the most well-known scriptures for those people and for people that do believe that they're Christians and go to church. So this is like one of the most misquoted, misused, abused verses in the Bible. So next week's topic is going to be amazing what we're going to talk about and what God really said. And I'm not going to tell you the topic. You'll just have to come back (laughs) next week to figure out what that topic is. But it is seriously, it is one of the most popular verses with non-believers and believers alike that people say that this is what God says and thinks. But we're going to look at what the scripture actually says about that. So one of the things that uh, is true as we get into this is at Ovation Church, we believe that scripture, that this Bible is God's word about God and that this is God's word about mankind. This is not man's ideas about God. This is not um, uh, uh, man's ideas about what God thinks about us. This is God's ideas. This is God's plan. This is God's heart. This is God's will for us. And so when we think of it in those terms, we go to Scripture as an authority in our lives. And so if we want to know what God says, we go to Scripture to see it because this is the Word of God. And so, you know, in fact... This isn't one of the things that we're going to address, but since we're talking about it, I'll address it. So, so here you go. Um, so one of the things that oftentimes people would say is that you can't know what the will of God is. 
Yeah, you can. He wrote it for you, actually. He actually sent you a letter to tell you what his intentions were. And so you can actually read the Bible and know what the will of God is. And in fact, maybe you've been on the phone with someone before, been discussing details before, and you talk about it, where to meet, when to meet, who's bringing what, maybe a family get together with uh, Thanksgiving coming up. And, and so you say, this is the plan. This is what we're going to do. And then people show up and it's like, oh, I didn't know I was supposed to bring that. I thought you were bringing that. Wasn't Uncle Tim bringing that? And, and all of a sudden, all of these things are miscommunicated. Here's a hint. Write it down, right? Like write it down, group text. I know we all hate group text, right? But, but group text, this is what's going to happen. And everybody knows the plan. God wrote it down for you. And so we can actually go back to the source and look at it and see what God really says about himself and what God says about us. This is God's word. It reveals who he is. And it also reveals who you are. And so we can go to scripture and it's like this mirror that we can read scripture and it shows us who we really are, who God created us to be. And so we go to scripture as that authority. Now, so when it comes to scripture, three things, you can write these down if you want, or if you're not writing stuff down, taking notes, then just write it down anyway. Three things that you need to know it is number one, when, we, when it comes to uh, reading scripture and understanding it, number one, understand the context. So often our culture, our society, like I said, it has these Christian roots, this Christian influence. And and so we know bits and pieces, enough to be dangerous with it, right? And we will take individual scriptures, we'll take two or three passages, take it completely out of context as if it stands on its own and base an entire theory or belief system on this passage, And so when we do that, we can actually end up manipulating it and meaning something that God never really intended. And that happens so often. So what we do is we have to understand scripture within the context. What I mean by that is you need to know who wrote it, who it was being written to, the time frame, maybe what was going on in culture at the time. You need to know before those passages, after those passages. It'd be good to know uh, the main subject and purpose of that letter being written or that book of the Bible being written, the main message of it being communicated. And when you understand that context, you can say, okay, these three verses within that context, this is what's being said. And that's the proper way to to understand scripture is we have to understand it within context. Number two, we need to let scripture interpret scripture. Here's the thing is that in all throughout scripture, uh, there's this commonality that runs through all of these books and all of these authors written uh, over the course of 1,400 years or so. And there's this common theme that runs through it because there were different writers, but one author, right? Amen. Somebody get excited about that, right? God's the author. And so, so here's the thing is that we can read about marriage in the Old Testament, but it doesn't give us the full picture of what marriage is. So we can go over to the New Testament and the gospels and read what marriage is about. We can go to the epistles, stuff that Paul wrote and the disciples wrote, and we can read about marriage. And so by letting scripture interpret scripture, we can get a full picture of what God's design for marriage is. And so what we do is we let scripture interpret scripture. We can't just take one passage or one chapter and say, this is what God means. We have to look at it in its entirety throughout scripture. Uh, Number three, this is the last point about understanding scripture, is number three, we need to apply what we learn. See, here's the thing is that uh, this is not a text to be studied as much as it is a letter to be lived. Okay, this is uh, not just to be hearers only, the Bible says, but to be doers also, because if we're only hearers and only learn, but we never live, then we deceive ourselves thinking that God's really doing something in our lives. And so what, the, what we have to do is we have to uh, understand it within context. We need to allow scripture to interpret scripture, not our experiences interpret scripture. And then we need to start living it out in our lives. That, that's our view of the Bible, the word of God. So that is important because when somebody claims that God said something, it's not your opinion and their opinion and somebody else's opinion and a talking head on TV's opinion. We go to the word of God and we say, okay, what did God really say? And we can find it and hear what God really said. And that's what we're doing during this series is we're looking at the things that God really did say. So what we believe God says, what he desires his purpose and his plan, what we believe about that, what we understand about that, what we accept about that, 
really does affect so many areas in every area of our lives. Your relationships, your finances, your, your purpose in life, all of your life is directed by what you believe about that. And so it should be accurate. I mean, you don't want to m- believe something that's not true. I mean, that wouldn't be smart. It would lead you somewhere that God doesn't actually desire you to go. And, and then the danger of that is when we get off path for what God has for us, then we're outside of his protection, we're outside of his blessing, and then Things in life just don't work out for us because God didn't create us for those things. And, and so we want to live the, the, the life that God truly intended for us because it's actually the best life for us that, that we can actually live out in his goodness and blessing for us. And so, so this is the first statement that we're going to talk about. The, this is so common in our culture and what we're dealing with today, this topic. And I hear religious leaders say this. I hear politicians say this. I hear celebrities say this, well-meaning Christians post this on Facebook. There's a meme for it. Oh, you know it's got to be true if there's a meme and it's on Facebook, right? That's like written in stone by the hand of God at that point, right? That's like a tablet from Almighty. No, okay, so so this statement right here that we're going to address and we're going to tackle today is a well-meaning person will stand up and declare We're all God's children. Now, oftentimes, in the context of a disaster or something that has happened, even with what's going on in uh, uh, Hurricane Harvey in Houston, the Gulf Coast area, the devastation that's there, and we see people suffering. Uh, Right now, man, we just uh, believe uh, for safety and security for those that are in uh, 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 Miami right now or in uh, Florida with Hurricane Irma coming through there and everything. And so in moments like that where there is suffering, our hearts are touched by that, and we want to do something about that. We, we want to help those people, and oftentimes a rallying cry will see people suffering and to motivate people to get involved, to motivate people to care. Someone well-meaning will say, we got, we got to do something about this. After all, we're all God's children. Well, it sounds, sure to sound pretty, doesn't it? Or, you know, even... The tragedy that happens overseas, you got Syria and Raqqa and you've got ISIS and people being oppressed and people being uh, uh, abused and tortured, mistreated. And so well-meaning people would see people that are completely different than us, completely different culture, uh, believe completely different, talk completely different, have very little things in common, but yet will say that tragedy shouldn't happen. After all, we're all God's children. And you've heard that, I've heard that, a well-meaning friend of yours could state that. Maybe you've even said it yourself, and maybe you think, well, yeah, duh, pastor. Like, of course we're all God's children. Okay, let's look at what Scripture actually says. And here's the thing is that that statement and that idea oftentimes uh, said with good intentions sounds very pretty. And here's the truth is that it actually contains quite a bit of truth. And the reason why it is so accepted is because there's aspects of it that really are true. And and so I want to point out two aspects of that that we emotionally connect with that are actually true, that that pulls on our heartstring to, to accept that. And number one is that everyone is valuable. The Bible is clear that everyone is valuable. And when we see someone suffering, when we see hardship, when we see somebody hurting, it should wreck us. Our hearts should be tender to that. We should be full of compassion to want to intervene and to help and be a part of recovery and stop disaster in people's lives. Because if you accept the scripture and if you have this relationship with God and because you were created in his image and should have his heart, then you should not want to see people suffering. And so we're pulled on our heartstring to say, say, no, that person is worthy, that person has value, and I'm not okay with them suffering. And so that's a true aspect of that statement, is that people 
are valuable. In fact, this is what it says in Genesis 1.27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. What that tells us is that people are the image bearer of God. And because people are the image bearer of God, they have value, they have worth. Scripture tells us that they are wonderfully and fearfully made. We are unique and individual in every person, every race, every ethnicity, every gender. They are valuable to God and God loves them and God cares about them, has a plan and a purpose for them. And so this rally cry to care about people is true. And we should accept that part of it, that that it really is true, that it matters. And here's the thing is that if we're created in the image of God, that makes us unique in all of creation. That, That people are worth more and more valuable than animals. People are worth more and more valuable than cockroaches. There is something different with mankind and with humans that is not true with the rest of creation. No other, a rock is not created in the image of God. I like my dog. Vader is 12 years old, part of our family. He is not worth more than my kids, okay? My kids have value that my dog doesn't, right? People are valuable. They are made in the image of God. And so when somebody says, we're all God's children, it stirs up in us the sense that people matter and people are important. And that's true. We, we ought to agree with that. But in, in fact, here's, here's something that you should write down. We must never demean what Christ died to redeem. We should never demean and devalue and, and, and degrade people when God saw them as worthy for Christ to come and pay his ultimate sacrifice for them. And so we have no business demeaning what Christ died to redeem. Okay, so number two, here's another uh, uh, truth that this contains, is that it's often a call to peace. It's this call to peace to say, set aside your differences, stop bickering about some things that don't matter, and and let's get along, and let's help each other out, and and let's not fight, and let's not quarrel. There's some truth to that. In fact, this is what uh, the Bible says in Romans 12, 18. It says, if it is possible, it's not always possible, but sometimes it is, and if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, and it doesn't all depend on you, but part of it does, Live at peace with everyone. See, Scripture calls us, if we're going to be followers of Christ, if we're going to live a life that honors God, then we should set aside some differences. We should not allow our differences to divide and cause destruction. There are some things that we should have an effort to get along with people, even with our Facebook posts, right? You don't always have to make a point. You don't always have to pick a fight. It's okay to have differences and not fight and fuss about it. That There are some things that you and I can do as followers of Christ if we want to be about what God is about, to be able to try to get along with some people, right? And stop picking fights with everyone. Here's the thing is that even on a personal level, this isn't talking about governments. This is talking about people. This is talking about you and your coworker, right? This is talking about students. This is talking about you and your teacher in math class. This is talking about you and your friends at the lunchroom. This is talking about you and your uh, uh, extended family and uncles and aunts and cousins. This is what Jesus says on a personal level what you should do. But to you who are listening, I hope that you're listening, I say, love your enemies Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And so there is so much truth in this idea that you and I should not be picking fights, should not be bickering about some things, that you and I ought to let some of that stuff go and make an effort to get along and care about each other. And so when a religious leader, a politician, a celebrity, a well-meaning Christian or friend stands up and says, hey, we're all God's children. Then it pulls on our heart, especially in those two ways that we respond to. So we're all God's children. It sounds good, but God never said that. Think about that. Read through the scriptures. Read through cover to cover. Not one time are you going to see that. So what do we do with that? Huh, that 
puts us in a pickle. So if God never said that, it does contain some truth. Like I said, there's some good aspects and intentions and motivations to it. God never said that. Here's the thing. Here's the danger with that. is if we accept that statement and apply it to our lives and apply it to our thoughts of God and humanity and ourselves, this is the danger in that statement. You're okay. I'm okay. You don't have to change. I don't have to change. We don't have to agree on anything. You believe what you want to believe. I'll believe what I want to believe. It's okay. We're all God's children. Let's hug. Let's all sit by a campfire. Let's roast some marshmallows. Let's sing Kumbaya. We're all God's children. That's not what the Bible says. And see, the danger in that, even in your own life, is for you to get lulled into this false sense of security that everything's okay and that you're all right, I'm okay, nobody has to believe anything, whatever you believe is fine, find your own way to God, it's all okay because we're all God's children. Is that, is that what God says? Okay, so let, let's look at this, let's look at this. This is what Jesus actually says, Jesus is a good place to go, right? And Jesus says in John 8, 38, 42, and 44, this is what he says, I'm telling you what I saw when I was with my father. So, so Jesus is saying, I'm going to reveal to you God. Okay? I'm going to tell you the things that I know about God. With my father in heaven, I'm going to reveal him to you. And he says, but you are following the advice of your father. So Jesus is saying there's actually two families, different fathers and different kids. And he says, so I'm over here on this side with God is my father, and I'm, you know, his son, his only begotten son, in fact, but he's not rubbing that in our face. And, and then he says, and then there's this group over here that you're following a different daddy because who's the daddy? And it's not my daddy, right? And so that's what Jesus is saying in the Jesse translation. And, and so he says, you're following the, the advice of your father. And then verse 40, 42, Jesus told them, if God were your father, you would love me because I have come to you from God. Verse 44, uh-oh, for you are the children of your father, the devil. Huh. And you love to do the evil things he does. Well, shoot, because I just thought we were all God's children. And Jesus says that actually there's this thing competing that's going on. And that you and I need to know which side we're on, and you and I need to know what part of the family we're on, and you and I need to know what, what father we're submitting to, because Jesus said, no, we're not just all God's children in Kumbaya. Jesus is saying, no, whoa. In fact, if Jesus were here and religious leaders are standing up, politicians are standing up, if celebrities and well-meaning believers are, are, are posting memes and, and saying, hey, get along, we're all God's children, Jesus would say, whoa, 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 hold your horses there, buckaroo. Texas Jesus would do that. <laughs> and he, Jesus would say it's not that way. Jesus would say that there's a problem with that thinking. In fact, this is, this is something else that Jesus says. Jesus even says this in Matthew 12, 30. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me. And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. And so Jesus is saying, wait a minute, there's a problem here that needs to be addressed. Jesus is saying, hey, we don't all play on the same team. And, and here's the problem is that even as well-intentioned believers and Christians, if you and I are taking advice from somebody that's on a different team, it's going to go bad for you. If we don't have the discernment and understanding to know God well enough to see counterfeit, 
then it's going to go pretty bad for you and I and our families and what God has for us if we're being led off track because we're uh, falling for things that God never really said and agreeing with ideas and worldviews that God never really put in place. And, and this is the problem with that is that so often, especially in our culture, most or many people, many people, I, uh, none of you in here, obviously you're here at Ovation, you love God with all your heart. But, but here's the thing, is that, why is that funny? See, some of you are like, I know them. Okay, so here's the, here you go. Is that most people, or many people in our culture, do not want to acknowledge that you and I are created in the image of God. Instead, they want to create a God in their own image. And so what will happen is they will say, you think about God however you want. You think about God however you want. We can all think about God however we want, but it's okay because we're all God's children. Let's sing it together. Kumbaya, light a lighter. No, and, and so Jesus is saying it's not that way. And there is so much danger in it when we actually start to believe that, when it's so false. Now, now and here's the thing. that It's not only that Jesus did not say and the Bible did not say we're all God's children, Jesus actually said the opposite. Like clearly stated the opposite of that. It's not that he just didn't, you know, he avoided the circumstance. No, he actually said the opposite. And so you and I need to realize this. So if you're taking notes, I know this is going to be hard for some of you to write down. Write it down. Get your pens ready. Loosen up your fingers a little bit. Here, write this down. The bad news. We are not all children of God. I know some of you don't even want to write it. You're like, you die, ah, the pen is blue, right? And you, your hand won't do it, right? And, and so here, here's the truth, though. We are not all children of God. The truth is, is that we are all God's creation. The truth is, is that God loves all of us. The truth is, is that sin separated us from our kind, loving creator, that's the truth. And that sin separated us from the family of God that he intended and that he desired and the, the relationship that he desired with his creation was broken because sin came in and sin destroyed that. That's the truth. In fact, this is what it says in Colossians 1.21. You were his enemies, separated from him, talking about God, by your evil thoughts in actions. Romans 3, 23 says, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. That's what God says. God says, it's not kumbaya, let's all get along, we're all God's children. God says there is a problem with sin and sin separates you from me and the relationship, the life-giving relationship that I want to have for you. See, Jesus even says in John 10.10 10, that I've come that you would have life and life abundantly, but there's somebody else, there's a thief that came to steal, kill, and destroy. And so there's this competition going on that's for your soul. And Jesus and God are saying we have to recognize that, we have to understand that, we have to acknowledge that in order to experience the freedom that can come, we have to understand what sin has done to ruin what God created. And so there's this glorious standard. And so there has to be this acknowledgement that there is right, there is wrong, there's a glorious standard. There is God's way, and then there is another way that is not God's way. And God's way is his family, and outside of that is not his family. And, and people can believe different things, and we can be kind to them, and we can love them, and we, can, we, we don't have to mistreat them, we don't have to fuss and fight with them. But if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to understand there was sin and that you were separated from God. And the only way to correct that is the sacrifice Jesus made. That's, what, that, that, that's the danger of this idea that we're all God's children. It ruins the entire gospel. Yes. It erases what Jesus did. It says we're all fine. We're all okay. Nobody changed a thing. We're all good. You don't need Jesus. You're fine. No, I know you. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. We have to acknowledge this. In fact, so Romans 3, 23 says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Boo-hoo. 
that's horrible. But God doesn't stop there. Listen to what it says in 24. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do at this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, not our righteousness, for he himself is fair and just. There is that standard. And he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. That's the gospel message. We have to recognize and understand that there's this separation, there's this depravity, that without Jesus there is no hope, that it's only in Jesus that we can be restored to God, that we have to understand that we need Jesus. So here's the good news. It was hard to write down the bad news, so so here's the good news. We have all been invited to become children of God of God. We serve a whosoever God. We serve a God of grace and love and nobody is so far gone that is without reach of of his arm to pull them in to his family, to his kingdom and to restore a relationship with him. There is no sin that is greater than God's grace. There is no fall, there is no failure that is greater than the sacrifice that Jesus made. We serve a whosoever God and whosoever would call on his name will be saved. And so there There's this opportunity. Sin destroyed what God wanted, but God in his love and grace sent Jesus to give us an opportunity to be reconciled back to himself, to be part of that family, and his arms are open. Jesus simply said, follow me. Jesus didn't say, change this, take care of this, agree with this, go do this, and then you can come follow me. Jesus said, come follow me and I'll take care of the rest. When we accept what Jesus has done, our lives begin to be transformed. And that's what we need, that we have all been invited to become children of God. In fact, this is what it says. This is so beautiful. John 1, 10 through 12, he, talking about Jesus, came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, talking about the Jewish people, and even they rejected him. 12, but to all who believe him and accept him, he gave the right to become the children of God. That's how it happens. That's where it happens, people. So this idea that we're all okay is completely contrary to what God's design is for you, for me, and for this world that he loves, and for people that are lost and fallen, and people that are drowning in the weight and the guilt and the shame of their sin. And Jesus offers hope. Jesus says you don't have to continue that way. There's a way out of that mess. And if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ, then you cannot sit there and accept this idea that we're all God's children. You're okay, I'm okay. No, Jesus is calling us to be an ambassador for him, to call people that are far from him back into relationship with him because he loves and it's his goodness that's going to draw people. This is what it says in Colossians chapter 1. Verse 21, 22, this is so true. This includes you. You here at Ovation, this includes you, who were once far away from God. You were enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's what Jesus said. That is what God said. And so my challenge to you is to break away from the cultural understanding and the cultural uh, phrase and idea or worldview that we're all okay, believe whatever you want. No, that flies in the face of our need and necessity of Jesus Christ. And so I hope that this challenges you to say, am I acknowledging my need for Jesus Have I been in this church thing long enough that I just think I'm okay, but I'm not being challenged to grow? 
Did I fall for that false truth that I'm okay and that nothing needs to change? Or, or do I need to sit here and examine myself and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal something in my life that needs to be different? And what about the comments that you make to some of your people that are coworkers or, or friends or neighbors? In light of this, is there maybe something as a follower of Christ you should be doing different to draw them into a relationship? Because here's the truth is if we really understand what God said, our hearts should be broken and hurting for people that are far from God because they're not okay and it's not okay for them to stay that way. We've got to be compassionate and care about them to draw them in to the relationship with the loving creator that he designed them for. Because without that, there is no hope. And without that, there is nothing but destruction waiting for them. And maybe, maybe God has put you in that place and in that place area, maybe that work, maybe that family for you to make a difference for him, for the people that are outside of his family that he wants inside of his family. Let's pray. God, thank you for this message. Thank you for challenging us to truly uh, uh, learn and live out what you actually said. God, I pray that this message uh, confronts and combats and even corrects some of the false understanding that we have about you. And God, I pray that this brings this clarity to our lives that we then don't just learn, but we begin to live. And we really do begin to be an ambassador and represent you well to the people in our lives that are outside your family. God, we exist for people outside the family. The church is an institution that exists for people not inside the institution. And so God, we love and we care for them. We're not judgmental. We're not accusational. We're not gonna fight and fuss about things, but we're gonna show them the goodness in the love and the grace. And just like Jesus, we're going to be the friend of sinners. And we're going to say it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. And we're going to call people back into relationship with you so that we can see you transform their lives. And God, thank you for allowing us to be a part of that. As we're praying, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe you're here today and maybe you've never been confronted with this truth that we're not all God's children and I don't know what team you're on. And maybe Jesus would say to you, like he said to those religious people, you're of your father, you're devil. And that simply means your heart isn't connected with God the way that it should be through the sacrifice of Jesus. Maybe you've been living for yourself. Maybe you've been so preoccupied with just the busyness of life that God hasn't had a part. That can change. And the truth is, is that You can't fix the things in your life. If you could, you would have already done that. You need Jesus. You need a Savior to save you from the sin and from the ramifications of sin in this world and in your life. If you're here this morning, maybe you've been a believer, maybe this is your first time to really be confronted with the true gospel message of Jesus, I want to give you a chance to raise your arm and to acknowledge that there are some things in your life that you need to address And that right now, you're willing to surrender and say, Jesus, I want all of you. And I want you to be my Lord. And I need Jesus. And if that's you, raise your hand this morning. I see your hands. Thank you. I see your hands. I see your hands. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. God, as we pray this morning, God, I pray that those that raise their hand, that it's not just some emotional response, but that, Holy Spirit, you're really tugging at their heart. You're pricking their heart. And that, God, that is a response to surrender to you and to accept the work that you're doing. And, God, as they do that, you're faithful and just to forgive us. And, God, your word says, God, you said that there is no condemnation to those that believe. So right now, any guilt, any shame for past and mistakes and sin is wiped away. That, God, you take away the old and you make all things new. God, they have a new future, a new hope, and that their faith is renewed in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God a hand this morning.